What can police officers learn from embroidery, hotel staff from ballet, and software developers from video art? Companies and organizations such as Microsoft Research, Marriott Hotels, and yes, Chicago Booth, are increasingly creating visiting artist programs, inviting artists to share their insights as a way to spur creativity and innovation. But does it work? And is artistic creativity really the same as creativity in business? Welcome to The Big Question, the monthly video series from Capital Ideas at Chicago Booth. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Canis Prendergast is the W. Allen Wallace Professor of Economics and the Booth Faculty Fellow at Chicago Booth. A former editor of both the Journal of Political Economy and the Journal of Labor Economics, his interests are wide-ranging from the contemporary art market to bureaucratic behavior and pay for performance. As well as his research and teaching, he's also the faculty member who helps choose the artworks housed in Chicago Booth's Harper Center, which Bloomberg Businessweek last year called the best-kept secret in the Chicago art world. Harry Davis is the Roger L. and Rachel M. Getz Distinguished Service Professor of Creative Management at Chicago Booth. A pioneer of leadership education and creator of Booth's Management Lab, he's also served as board member at the National Opinion Research Center and the Argonne National Laboratory and has consulted for manufacturing firms, agribusinesses and art museums. His essays were collected last year in the book Why Are You Here and Not Somewhere Else? And John Michael Shett is the first visiting artist and social entrepreneur at Chicago Booth, where he works with students and faculty to explore the creative process. A ballet dancer by training, he's been a member of American Ballet Theatre and Alonzo King Lines Ballet. He also co-founded and served as executive director of the ballet company Trey McIntyre Project. Panel, welcome to The Big Question. Canis Prendergast, let me start uh, with you. What does making art have to do with making profits? So uh, I think of making profits, and it's the way we teach our students here, is largely about problem solving. You have consumers who have needs, your firm, you have markets, and largely good management is trying to solve problems in a way that maximizes your profits. I think of art in exactly the same way. Artists are trying to say something to the world, they're trying to communicate, and they also have to solve problems to do that in the most efficient way or the most effective way that they feel they can do. Okay. Harry Davis, do, do, do you accept that parallel? The Solving problems is essentially what artists are doing well, and what business people are doing. <clears throat> yeah, I, I like the idea of, of dealing with problems, but I wouldn't say solving problems. Uh, I think firms need to do two things well. They need to exploit what they're very good at doing, but they also need to explore new possibilities. And I think the world of the arts is a world of creative thinking, uh, new ways of looking at the world. It strikes me that that perspective may in fact be very useful for business people. Okay. Well, I'm going to press you a little later on what it really, whether that creativity really translates to the to the bottom line. But uh, as an artist, John Michael Shett, what was your view? Is 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 problem solving basically what you're doing? I think in a sense, I think a lot of what art is is research, it's research, research and development for the future. We're thinking about not just what is, but synthesizing what is and telling it in a unique story in a unique way that's looking to how it could be. A lot of times, it's aspirational or it's just a very eloquent telling of a story. And the closest distance between two people is a story. So I think good art is really connecting people. I think the monetization of art and is art being made to make a profit. I think a lot of artists see the profit side as, as, a, as a welcome sort of second stage, but they focus more on the, the forming of the idea and the process. So I, I, I think Art has great validity and value to business because it's allowing us to delve deeper into a creative process which arrives at new invention. I think that's the role that art can play. Okay. Harry Davis, something you said earlier, mm -hmm. let's press you a little bit on that, on creativity. Mm -hmm. You're, you teach creative management. Mm -hmm. uh, why is creativity of the artistic kind uh, important in the workplace? I think the first thing that comes to mind is that so often in business, we think about creativity as coming from groups. We have to sit around and have a brainstorming session. And I would argue that to some extent that is relevant. But it strikes me that often in the world of the arts, the original sort of seed that is so important is an individual contribution. And I think that certainly with, with Canis's interest in art itself, or my, I have a great interest in music, it's the composer 
that puts the score in place. And to some extent, I, th I think that art, to some extent, celebrates both the individual and the group context. And I think it's something that is somewhat out of balance in the business context. Okay, explain. How, how so? Well, I think we, we tend to think that the way we solve problems is to get together in a group. The way, the way we, we come up with new ideas is we, we brainstorm together. And I'm, I think I've worked on this for a long time. I really believe that you need a group but often the group is there to fine tune the idea of an individual. And I think the, the, the artistic world is a world that celebrates the individual genius of putting things on the table for other people to play with and, and shape. So does that practically mean that people overmanage? Should they let people alone and allow their employees to flourish and be individuals? I like that idea. It was a question. <laughs> is that, is that, should, I like that the what idea. Should be doing? Yeah. You know, I, I think one of, one of the things, if, if we look at this institution, we have an enormous respect for the individual and the ideas that they have. But we also have this very active phenomena of workshops where people take their ideas and people throw things at them and, and push them. And I think that's very much in the tradition of the artistic world. And so we see it on the scientific side, the notion of possibly looking at it on the artistic side and seeing how these two worlds overlap strikes me as exciting. Okay. Can I spend a guess, is there really a, a direct connection between artistic creativity and create the kind of creativity you need to, you know, reward shareholders and build companies? Yes, I think so. I think my sense is that we learn in very different ways. And I think of art as, lar as essentially a different language. I mean, I have my own language, I do research, um, but one of the things I've learned, because I've been lucky enough to put together an art collection here, is that there are different languages people use to often say the same thing. And sometimes those languages work in beautiful and very different ways. We have a very strong tendency sometimes to think that only people that speak our language are those that we can learn from. Academics are as bad as many on this, but it's also true. Engineers think they only learn from other engineers. But I think the beauty of art is that it's taught me, at least, that I can learn at least as much from other people who are different to me than I learn from people who are the same as me. And I think that's one of the great le lessons that I learn from an interest in art. And I suspect, for me, it could be that there's lessons I learn from different types of creativity. But the one thing I know is I have a lot to learn from the artistic dimension. OK, but I mean, being a creative in an artistic sense is about taking risks. It's about being edgy ahead of the game, you know, uh, uh, doing stuff and failing. How do companies balance that approach with the need, you know, not to upset people, to, be, to, be, uh, to manage their risk? I think we have to distinguish between two things, okay? I think there are some organizations or institutions where risk per se and taking risks per se is something you have to be very cautious about. So if I'm on an operating table, I typically don't want the employees you know, the nurses, the doctors taking risks at that point. And those are, there are some institutions that inherently have that feel. Our institution is the exact opposite end, which is I do research, okay, and I can try things out in the classroom. For institutions like research, you typically want the best that anybody has done. We can throw away the second best. We can throw away the 15th best. Those are institutions where I, th those are reasons why what you make sometimes is inherent and apparently aff affects your decisions to take risk. However, I think a lot of the way that organizations are set up is that we tend to penalize people often for making mistakes. And I think we have to distinguish between the inherent product that you make and the way that the reward structures are set up in organizations, that those are the kind of cases where we have to try and encourage people to take risks. Okay. Harry Davis, on that note, about, about taking risks in companies, often it's, if the payoff is positive, then the risk was a, was a great decision. If, it was like, if, if the payoff is yeah. bad, then, uh, then it was a terrible... Yeah, I mean, that, that's easy example. to understand after the fact. But the, but, the, but the whole notion, indeed, of work and strategy is that you make certain assumptions about if you take certain actions, this is what's likely to happen in the future, but we don't have any data yet about the future. So, in fact, uh, it, it's a sort of being much more connected to the process than, I think, being connected to the outcome. And I think we, we tend to tell these stories after the fact of, of good outcomes. Way well, it must have been a great process. But in fact, it could have been due to many, many other factors. I mean, I've, I've, I've learned from John Michael uh, in, in the sense of dance that sometimes the greatest creative 
leaps take place when people come to the edge and almost fall, which we'd argue is a mistake. It's true in jazz uh, that the, the greatest improvisational breakthroughs happen when people throw me the wrong note. And therefore, learning to deal with what's thrown at you and to create from that, I think, is, is really very powerful. But I wonder if, if you go even further. I mean, what if they do fall? Is there some, we often say that, you know, to yeah. tell, tell business students there's, there's something powerful in failing and learning from that. That's something that presumably the artistic process gives you is, is this, this space to fail. Do companies give their employees enough room to experiment and fail? Well, it's hard to generalize across all companies, but I think the notion of encouraging people to try things that are not going to put the company out of business makes a lot of sense. In fact, I know a number of people that say, I really want to hire people that have had an experience where they made, quote, a mistake, unquote, and learned an enormous amount from it. That's the kind of person that I think we really should promote. John Michael Shett, the, uh, what, what's your approach to this, this question about risk and whether people in business and in you know, uh, traditional organizations that have not been exposed to artistic creativity, uh, are they prepared to take the risks and, and to expose themselves to the possibility of failure? I think it's interesting. There's like in a ballet context, I don't think we'd ever see it as failure. We wouldn't call it that. It's, it's more like it's rapid fire iteration. And because there's also this group context and you're going through a rehearsal process where you're fine tuning, you're doing it in some respects. Earlier, we talked about the group versus the individual. I think real artists do reach a level of self-creative process. And then when they get in a group, they're able to communicate in a variety of ways. Some of it's intuitive and nonverbal, but something might go wrong but it's not seen as a failure. It's seen as opportunity or possibility. Yes, if someone falls and breaks a bone, that's ob a massive failure. But it's, it's more about trying and constantly fine tuning and finding new ways and new approaches. And I think that's what's very much needed in a lot of um, business culture. I mean, the words cold, uh, creativity and innovation are huge buzzwords right now. And I think people are saying, well, how do we do that? How do we go about it? I do think there's a lot to learn from an artistic environment. Because we don't, it's a failure, I think, if you've invested a lot of resources and gone very far along the path and then it doesn't work and you can state a loss, that's a failure. But I think if you've set up a context and environment where you're able to keep trying and approaching it from different angles and everybody's bringing their best work, you know, uh, people at Google talk about emergent leadership, which is the idea that you step forward, you have an idea, you're in control of the room, you're leading the idea, the concept. Maybe someone says something that counteracts what you're saying and then you have a low, you know, your ego is such that you can then blend back into the ensemble. They want those sorts of teams where people are bringing their best work but able to keep collaborating. To me, that mirrors exactly what happens in a dance studio. So do you, are you I mean, you work with businesses, you've been working here with students and faculty at Booth. Do you, do you find people in the business world receptive to the kind of ideas you're talking about? Or is it kind of something that they do because, you know, it, it's being done and it's kind of of the moment and then they go back to doing their you know, 43 point uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation as they were before? I think shockingly so. They're very, they've been very interested. Now, I'm a big fan of finding a personal and an organizational balance. There's nothing wrong at all with having the 43 point presentation and the data that shows what has come before and what is needed and what's necessary and what our strategy is. I think I'm very interested in exploring the space in between. So if there is a strategy and there's five points that have to be accomplished, how do you go about creating them? What is the space in between that you're discussing and evolving? So Harry and I have done a number of presentations now for um, advanced management and for alumni groups as well as for students. You know, I've interacted with staff and senior staff here at Booth. I've had many conversations with faculty members like Canis. I would say everyone's very interested in a true Chicago Booth fashion. They're interested and they say, now prove it. And I think there's something to that that I'm learning as an artist that our world does need to better articulate and prove that we have this value that we can bring. But in the receptivity of the business world has been very high. Okay, wonderful. Harry? I, you know, I've brought uh, jazz ensembles into class. Uh, I've had executives and MBA students watch Charlie Newell, who's the artistic director of the university's court theater, working with actors. And not only do I find them tolerant of this, I find them actually very excited about it because they begin to see a different way of interacting than we typically 
observe in in day-to-day -day meetings in either here as students work in groups or in companies a much more uh, what I call a much more of an ensemble working together and in, in John Michael's sense an incredible amount of give and take and using data from peripheral vision and so forth that they don't typically think about but quite the opposite of being resistant I, I found them hungry for this which I must say because I t typically like to experiment I was surprised that there was this much enthusiasm. Janice? So let me add one thing to that and I don't know how Harry and John Michael feel on this but one thing I've learned from the arts is actually often that greatness makes me feel really uncomfortable initially. <laughs> Uh, and I think, I mean, I've learned this from looking at the visual arts, which is often I see something great and new, and I really don't like it when I see it. And it's only a year later I realize how great it is. And I think one of the difficulties, one of the difficulties that the arts has taught me about in a business context is that, you know, the profit often is not liked initially. And I've sort of learned that about the art collection here, that we have bought things that were very comfortable to me when I purchased them, and they turned out not to be so good. And it's often the things I'm most upset about or most kind of uncomfortable about are the ones that really end up leaving the firmest mark for me. Okay. John Michael? Uh, I would add to what Kansas is saying. We've had this conversation before that discomfort is a large part of the creative process. So putting yourself in a place where you don't know and are somewhat uncomfortable, but you're putting yourself through this process of, of delving into the unknown and making sense of it, to me that's a huge component of what we call creativity, what I call creativity. I think it... Um, because it makes us uncomfortable, and because you can't state the, what the outcome will be, but you're committing to the process, that is anathema at times to how business functions, where you need to know what the end goal is going to arrive at. But the best works of art, and I think of, of products that I personally consume, are ones that have a process built in. It's like a well-marbled piece of meat. And there's this level of innovation that's constantly you know, um, ingrained. And to me, that makes for a more exciting product. So even to your first question earlier, I think products are enriched by a creative process. Do you have the appetite and the stomach to allow the time and the resources to go through that process? That's a big question. Right. Can, can I, so I wanted to ask you about the art, because we, we have this tremendous art collection here at Chicago Booth, and, and you're one of the people who, lucky people who gets to, to pick uh, the art that's there. But I mean, to what extent, you know, you obviously put a lot of thought into what goes on the, on the wall. Um, to what extent does that really feed, in a, in a practical way, feed into the creativity of the, of the faculty and, and the students here? And to what extent is it just something that's, you know, interesting, but it's on the wall and then I walk past it once I've looked, looked at it? I think one of the things that we've tried to do with the art collection, along with my colleagues who are choosing to work with me, is that we try to use the art collection to align with the mission of the school, and we think of the mission of the school as curiosity. So we are not trying to put things that look pretty on the wall that you see the first time and never notice again. I think largely what we're trying to do is get people to think about the world in a different way. And we've done that in various ways. One is through tours, one of it is through labels on works. And I have to give great credit to the student council who've basically been involved in designing a phone-based app in order to aid people in that. So largely it's about what I called language originally, which is trying to find a way to say something about the world that's different to the other languages that we have. But do you have, do you, is it your sense that, you know, there are companies that do this, they'll buy, you know, the, the owners mm -hmm. will be very interested in, in, in contemporary art, so they'll buy very challenging work and put it up. Is it really, is it really, uh, does it really feed more creativity than having, you know, a sort of beautiful traditional Stubbs painting or, the, you know, something like that on the wall? I think we tell or our, Mona Lisa, well. I think we tell our employees a lot about what we choose to surround them with. And I think what we choose to surround our students with is prompts to get them to think about the world. And I think a Stubbs painting, as you describe it, is a different kind of prompt. I think for the mission that we have here in the school, in terms of the idea that you try to question everything, which is such an important issue for our students moving forward, and for our faculty and for our staff, I think it fulfills that mandate. You know, if I could add, um, I, w I, I don't know if Canis would agree with this, but I, I would consider the art <coughs> somewhat edgy. I think it... it, it makes people sometimes uncomfortable. But that is exactly what our faculty are rewarded for, which is working on a question that initially people may say, why are you asking that question? And then years later, it turns out to, to be actually critical to the, the advancement of the field. So I think it's very much, uh, it's very different than just putting something on the wall that's attractive or 
you know, just happens to be Canis's idea. You know, I, I was reading um, a couple of weeks ago the, 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 this lecture given by a Nobel laureate in physics from the university, uh, Ch uh, Chandra Sekhar, and he was comparing Beethoven, uh, Newton, and Shakespeare, saying, well, what what might explain their creativity across these fields? Is there anything that's related? And, and his conclusion was, they all produced beauty, which I thought was very interesting because he defined beauty, uh, quoting Heisenberg, as all of the pieces fitting together and relating to each other, but also related to the whole. And I think that would be true of research, it would be true of art, it would be true of music, it would be true of dance. So I, I think that there's a real, there's a real uh, commonality to what we're doing here, rather than we're doing something really different. John Michael, you talked earlier about uh, how you know you thought that, that dancers or dance companies could learn from some of the kind of prove it, demonstrate data-driven approach that that, that, uh, that we have here at Chicago Booth. Um, what, what do you think, in your view, what what are the what, what about the reverse? What are some of the institutional arrangements that can enable creativity to flow that companies could adopt, say, from dance companies or other, you know, artistic creative organizations? It's difficult to create space for the unknown. Maybe that's blocking off moments in the calendar where you have, you give yourself on an individual level or, the, or an institution says, we expect you, as some corporations have done, you know, to take 10% or 15% of your time to go work on projects in your own way and in your own space. Something I've been doing here with uh, members of the staff at Chicago Booth is talking about how do you make space for the unknown? How do you block off time in your day to literally daydream or take a walk? And these are tried and true sort of methods, but they are proven effective. A big part of creativity is not being uber productive all the time and also having a level of trust with yourself and your team that when you need to be very effective, you can be. But I think we have a, you know, sort of a nine to five work mentality where you're also constantly proving your worth and the proving is important, but I think you have to be strategic about when you're doing and when you're being. So empathy is a big role that, I think a big skill that artists have developed. How are you processing the world around you and really listening? And that's not just verbal, but nonverbal. And how are you picking up on cues and how are you really interpreting? I think everyone, every human does that. But I think to a degree, sometimes it's trained out of us and we become much more task oriented. And so I, I see a role, um, a role that artists can greater play in an environment like this is helping create space, helping give permission for people to try things, helping give permission for, for leaders to acknowledge that it's not a waste of time to use time in unique and creative fashions. So I think you have to role model it though. And you have to have examples that it will still result in something that's worthwhile. It's not just this completely unbalanced, you know, cliched artist who has no focus and is just you know, in this sort of like other world all the time. No, there is a balance of, of doing and being productive and also time for a reflective process. You talked about companies giving their employees 15 minutes or whatever it is uh, every week to, to do something creative. Typically what they're doing is something related to, to their job. They're not, you know, dancing ballet or painting. So if they were, would that be, would they be more creative? Well, I think creativity doesn't have to be through a creative quote unquote art form. I think the form, and Kenneth was getting at this earlier, we all speak different languages. But when you become masterful in one language, you write, you can look around and see masters in other languages. And I think that's the, the vehicle, the medium through which you get to that is maybe important. Canis finds it through his research and his process. And I mean, I'll sort of quote you from a few weeks ago, we took a group of MBAs over to the Smart Museum and gave a tour. And Canis said something very poetic that his research is his art. That is how he sort of makes sense and finds beauty, as Harry was just alluding to, of how these pieces all fit together. I might do it through dance. So I don't think trying to prescribe to someone, go take a ballet class and you'll be more creative, that's not gonna work. It's about, through their medium, helping them make better choices and better know themselves so that they can iterate, evolve, try new things. So it's not this uh, foreign application of another form that's gonna help you. I think it's helping you better understand yourself. Right. Managers are going to love that. They're going to say to their employees, be creative by going out and making sales calls. <laughs> Harry Davis, apart from this sort of, I, I like the way you described the creating the space for, for people mm -hmm. to do for daydreaming or, or doing no, no, nothing that isn't sh things that aren't scheduled. Harry, what, what else can companies do to, 
to encourage creativity, maybe people, companies that don't have the resources to bring in an artist in residence but, or to buy expensive artworks but, but want to create a, a, a creative environment? Well, maybe I can build on something John Michael said. I, I think to some extent the danger is to say, well, we, we want more creativity, so here's a certain percentage of your time or here's a, here's a certain playing field for you, which I think can, can often shut people down. It would be as though somebody said to, to Canis, oh, by the way, uh, Canis, you, you need to do more empirical work rather than theoretical work because that's, that's what we really value. But that's not, that's not who he is. So I, I think the notion uh, really is how do you let go to let people interact and sort of be who they are and bring their process into the workplace. Because I think we learn, we learn by, by understanding another, an, another area's work process or creative process, as you may, as you may see. So I, I think one of the things that, that we're, we're thinking about here at the school is we don't want to overly specify what an artist is going to do at the school. If, if they are interested in, in, as we are interested in interacting with a different audience, they will find vehicles and ways to make that happen. To not only leave space for creativity, don't tell them how to be creative. It, it, when you, was, when yeah. you were talking, I was thinking of the companies where they have ping pong tables and pool tables yeah, right. and nobody ever uses them because right. presumably that's not what they want to do during, yeah. uh, during uh, working hours. Canis uh, Prendergast, a lot of art is about uh, challenging the status quo. Uh, challenging things that came before, or even disrespecting history in some sense. How is that useful for companies? I think in a time of change, one always doesn't want to get locked into the status quo. I think part of art's objective is per se to challenge the status quo, and finding the right role for that type of challenge is a more nuanced one in business. But I do think there's a tendency for most of us to gravitate towards the status quo. That was part of why we feel discomfort when we feel the new, even when, particularly when the new is a far distance from what we've done. So I would say the lesson for business is actually to be to listen and to listen to sources that are different to the usual sources that we listen to often. We find out what we most want to hear. I mean, I noticed this in my own work, which is I have realized over the years that usually when I do my own research, the idea comes from somewhere outside my own area. You know, it's from reading the newspaper, mm -hmm. it's reading the sports pages, it's going to an art gallery. And I think sometimes we use these languages that we've talked about before. Languages are great, they allow us to communicate, but sometimes they constrain us too. And I think part of the beauty of talking to people from different fields, and I think of art as just one language, is that maybe they can teach us something, but we have to open our ears. And that's mm -hmm. kind of hard to do sometimes. John Michael Shedd? What's I find very interesting in being in this environment is also learning from the scientists and the economists that are here. What, what Kenneth just stated, there's now science to prove that creative creativity and ideation happens when you turn away from a problem and allow your unconscious and subconscious to keep working on it. That's why you know, ideas happen to you in the shower and whatnot. There's science to prove these things, which is really fascinating for me to bring back to my brethren and say there's, there's a well-grounded scientific method that can show us that what we're doing is worthwhile. But I very much agree with, with what Candice and Harry have been saying about how we learn from other worlds. And one of the things I think most excited me in coming and, and sort of helping build this position at Chicago Booth was uh, Harry introduced me to a colleague and said, I hope that someone like John Michael can help us break down silos, that we can understand each other better. And I think part of the role of the artist is living in, in between the silos and being a translator. And I've, when people ask me what do I do here, my short answer these days is that I feel like a translator. I'm not here being a ballet dancer, and I'm not trying to be an economist. I'm not here to get an MBA. I'm here to make sense of all these worlds and maybe find the common language and the differences and the similarities and better articulate them so that we can learn. And I think artists, to a degree, have certain skills like empathy, uh, combinatorial creativity, the ability to see a lot of what's happening, distill it, process it, and deliver it back in a very eloquent fashion. Those are great skills, great roles that hopefully we can lend to this world, but I know what I'm taking away is weight and the gravity of really going deep into a question and an idea and challenging, uh, asking challenging questions and being challenged. And in true classic Chicago booth fashion, I'm being challenged every day. I'm very uncomfortable a lot of the time. Luckily, as an artist, I'm, un 
I'm, on, I'm to a degree comfortable with being uncomfortable, but it's making me more articulate and more certain about what I have to lend to this world. Okay, wonderful. Well, on that note, it's our time to go and daydream. My thanks to our panel, Kenneth Prendergast, Harry Davis, and John Michael Shirt. For more research, analysis, and commentary, visit us online at chicagobooth.edu slash capideas. And join us again next time for another big question. Goodbye.